men have no idea how to treat women if they're in male power hierarchies. They have no idea how to treat them. And that's because we have no idea how to do that. No one has any idea how to do that. It's only been happening in any, you know, pronounced sense for about, well, on a societal level, really probably since the mid-70s. You know, that's, it's, it's three generations. It's a drop in the bucket. And it's a very, very difficult thing to sort out. So men are slightly bigger than women. And that's also generally characteristic of, of creatures that have a uh, dominance hierarchy that's tilted towards masculine. And then the other factor seems to be that um, hu human beings have, their, their infants, our infants, have very, 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 very long periods of dependence. And it's very difficult to maneuver your way doing anything, really, especially anything that has to do with competition and power, if you're taking care of, you know, one infant, let alone three. And so, it seems to me that those are all valid reasons why the primary power structures among human beings have typically been male and why they're represented as masculine. Now, I think there are other reasons too, because this is a multifaceted phenomenon. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about human females is that they're selective maters. Now, chimp females are not selective maters, and what that means is that the dominant males still have most of the offspring, but the reason for that, apparently, is because they chase the subordinate males away from sexually receptive females, although the sexually receptive females will sneak off behind a rock somewhere and mate with a subordinate male, but as long as the dominant male is around, the probability of that is quite low, so that the female chimps aren't sexually selective. Whereas human females have concealed ovulation so that no one knows when they're at their most fertile and they're selective maters. And women in every society virtually that's ever been studied have a typical pattern of behavior, which is that if you look at a, the female dominance hierarchy and you look at the male dominance hierarchy, the females will mate across and up dominance hierarchies and the males will mate across and down, which works fine for both genders because their interests align. But... Uh, but it also means that, in all likelihood, that women have exerted s tremendous sexual selection pressure on men. And that might be part of the reason, many, of the many reasons that we actually, you know, the, the theory is, is that the common ancestor between chimps and humans was a lot more like a chimp, a modern chimp, than like a modern human. So for whatever reason, we've undergone a lot more transformation in the last seven million years than chimps have. And one, one possible reason for that, and I think it's a highly probable reason, is that sexual selection operated a lot more viciously, so to speak, among humans. It's operated to the point where you have twice as many female ancestors as male. And you might think, well, that can't be possible, but here's how it's possible. It's like only every second man had children, had a child, while all women had one. Now, of course, that isn't what happened. But on average, that's what happened. So who exactly, who's responsible for the male dominance hierarchy? Because you could say, well, it's male competitiveness, but you could also say, yeah, well, it's an inevitable function of female selection. And so, which is not an argument that you hear very often. But I, I think it's a very difficult argument to escape from. And that leads us to our next hypothesis. So we're going to say, well, the masculine dominance hierarchy is represented as masculine. I'm going to call that the great father for the time being. And that's the permanent dominance hierarchy of men. And it's always there. It moves through history. It's different men all the time. But it's like the men slot in and out as they are born and die, but the structure itself stays intact across forever. It's the, always there. It's been there at least for millions of years. So for our purposes, we'll just call it permanent. It's a permanent part of the experience, and it's a big part of it. And, you know, as culture gets more and more covers larger and larger expanses of territory and gets more and more sophisticated, it's an ever larger part of reality. So, I mean, most of us spend almost all our time coping with the dominance hierarchy and almost none of our time combating nature. You know, you get wet, and today you get wet for a little while, and that's it, you know, but most of the problems that you would face in a purely natural environment, it's like you're so distant from them that... You can hardly even imagine, you can't even imagine what it would be like in, in some sense to be in an environment like that. So the question was, what drives women to, to move to the top of the hierarchy? 
it's something that's worth discussing. So if anybody objects to what I'm going to say, then please do, because I'm not, you know, dishing this out as received truth. It's, it's, I've been trying to figure this out, and this is what it looks like to me. The first thing is, I, I think there, that male and female dominance hierarchies both exist, but they're different. And that females compete with each other intensely, but they don't compete for the same things. And they don't compete the same way. So, let me tell you a little story. This is a bit of a divergence, but, I, but it's an interesting point, and one of, the, you know, one of the questions I've always been asked in this class is because I'm going to lay out a hero story for you, and the fundamental hero archetype, and the hero is masculine in mythology, and so the women always ask, well, what about the role of the woman, and it's like, it's very, very complex, which of course all you women already know, because it is very, very complex, so, but it isn't something that, first of all, I don't think it was a question that would have been asked before the invention of the birth control pill. Because we know what the archetypal, we know what the archetypal female is prior to that. It's the Virgin Mary with, with child. It's a virgin with child, which means like it, it means that the unit for woman is woman with child. It's not woman. It's woman with child. And well, that's it's obvious why that is. Because as soon as you become a woman in most societies, you have a child. Before that, you're a girl, and that's you know that's in some sense that's irrelevant you know, in terms of your destiny. Now, you might say, well, what, what's your archetypal pattern if you're not a mother? Well, the way it looks to me is that there's two archetypes for personal development, for the personal path, roughly speaking. There's the hero, and that would be the person who explores the unknown and discovers something of value and brings it back and distributes it to the community. So it's like a hunting it's, like, it's probably predicated on a hunting uh, platform because we, we, our bodies are hunting platforms, basically. So, you know, and one theory about what men did, which is a very probable theory, is that they went out and hunted for meat. And chimps like meat, they'll eat it whenever they can, although they're not very good hunters, but they will definitely eat meat. And human beings are so good at hunting that we probably, well, for example, we probably wiped out the mammoths. And when human beings came into North America, there was as many different kinds of large animals in North America as there was in Africa, and human beings killed all of them. And that was just with, you know, like, they didn't have our notion of technologically sophisticated weapons. It was bows and arrows and clubs and spears. And nonetheless, like, they got rid of everything, you know, large cats, giant beavers, mammoths. I mean, part of the reason that I'm thinking about these sorts of things is because I've been very interested in the fact that male, men are doing very badly in junior high and high school, and they're bailing out of the universities like mad. Like, in, at the rate it's going, there'll be almost no men in most disciplines within 10 years. So, I mean, you can tell that even in this class. You know, although, there, it's funny, because on my YouTube videos, I, w I look at the gender distribution for, for viewing, and it's 80% male. So, so anyways... Um, back to the archetypal re representation. I think really the, the way to think about it is that for men, the hero archetype is the, is the archetype that's dominant and in the forefront, and the maternal archetype is, is subordinate and in the background. I mean, in, inside their own psyches. Whereas with women, it's, it's reversed. So each of the genders can play the role of the other gender, but there's a tilt in each of them towards the, what would you say? Well, towards gender... I would say, towards typical human gender normative behavior. Now, the social constructionists believe that no such thing exists, but those people are so pathological that even considering what they have to say is a mistake. So, you know, they act as if people have, they act as if there is no biology and everything's cultural. And it's like, well, no, that's just not right. Now, what biology means in practice and what you should do about it, that's a whole different question. But to think of all these differences as socially height differences between men and women are not socially constructed. And they, they're relevant. And the upper body strength differences between men and women are not socially constructed. And they're relevant too. You know? So one of the things I was wondering about, maybe you guys can help me clarify this or tell me where I'm not thinking about this properly. And if you think there's any, if I'm missing something, let me know. One of the things my daughter said, she watched my, my son one day have a fight with his best friend. It was a physical fight, you know, and so 
my, his best friend did something that my son didn't regard as appropriate, and so uh, he hit him, and then there was a fight. And then, you know, three days later, they were friends again. And my daughter said to me that she was very annoyed by that, which wasn't the fight exactly, but the fact that they could have a fight, and then they were friends again three days later, because she said that that option wasn't available to women. Right? Now, and the option is, the option that the men have is, well, if you get out of hand, I'll just sock you one. And then we'll have established where the boundaries of, of civilized behavior begin and end. And I would say that, in my experience, if I'm talking to someone who's self-confident and masculine and accomplished, there's always an undercurrent of potential violence. It's, it's an undercurrent. And that's actually an undercurrent of respect, which means like there's things that we can do to each other in a civilized way, but there are rules that if you break, like all hell's going to break loose. And one of the consequences of that is that it doesn't, right? Now, the typical bullying pattern for women in high school and junior high is, is reputation destruction. And I'm wondering, what, does, what are the implications for the conduct of behavior if there is no recourse to aggression to solve disputes? Because they don't get solved. You know, I've tried to analyze what it means to say no to someone. Because no means something, right? No means, well, if you tell a child no, what you're basically telling the child, as far as I can tell, is that if you continue doing that, something you don't like will happen to you. And then if you're civilized at saying no, what happens is you say no a couple of times, and then instead of devaluing the word, which is what you do if you just said it over and over a hundred times with no consequences, you take action that's nonverbal, and so one of the things you might do is remove the child from the situation or you might put them on the steps or maybe you put them on the steps and they run away so you have to hold them on the steps but the point is the point to the child is there are limits and if you exceed them you will be physically controlled what if there's no option for physical control what happens well, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what women do about that, but I also don't know what men do about that in relationship to women. 